You are listening to the Bible teaching ministry of Pastor Ross Graham of Grace Bible Church, Kingswood, New South Wales, Australia. Ross will be using the inerrant word of God to draw our truth in its original context. To find more messages like this, visit www.gracebiblechurchkingswood.org or to join our online community, you can now find us on Facebook by searching for Grace Bible Church Kingswood. May this message today bless you and as always, bring glory to God. Here's Pastor Ross. Now let me begin tonight uh, by simply saying this to you that uh, I've always been moved by the story of Johnny Erickson Tata. She's now married of course, but uh, the story of Johnny Erickson originally. Who as a strong athletic girl dived into a shallow body of water. And a split second later, she was paralyzed from the neck down, completely helpless and still underwater. And though rescued from drowning by her sister, the doctors could not rescue Johnny from the paralysis that swept over her body. In the course of time, medically, uh, Johnny uh, came to accept the fact that she couldn't be healed. But what about God? Didn't the person of the Lord Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry uh, heal all kinds of paralysis and all kinds of sickness? Didn't he cast out demons and make people well? And the more Johnny thought and prayed about these things, uh, the more she became convinced that God would uh, heal her too. So I quote from Bruce Barron's book, The Health and Wealth Gospel. She brought together a group of friends and church leaders and set up a private healing service. The week before that service, she publicly confessed her faith by telling people, watch for me standing on your doorstep soon, I am going to be healed. On the scheduled day, the group read scriptures, anointed her with oil and prayed in fervent faith. Today, 15 years later, she is still a quadriplegic. She did everything right and seemed to have met all of the conditions, yet she was not healed. That book was published in 1987. It is now 2020 and still she is not healed. So the question in this church tonight, and for those of you who are watching on the internet perhaps, the question arises, was Johnny denied this miracle because she didn't have enough faith? There are some people who actually believe so. Others say she wasn't healed because of unconfessed sin in her life and how they were to assess that, uh, one would never know, but uh, uh, there are others who believe that as well. And still others would quibble uh, with her about uh, the healing technique that she used, saying that healing would come if she just followed their simple three-step process. You see it all the time with some of the big-time television preachers. But what do you think? Uh, The truth is today thousands travel around the world seeking those who claim to have what is commonly called the gift of healing. And testimonies of people uh, are declaring that they have been healed of some sickness or their legs have been lengthened and so on, uh, testimonies like that abound. They're all over the place in Christian circles. Special anointed cloths are even sold that are said to have mysterious healing powers. Are these things real? What about the use of medicine? Should we trust God alone for healing? What method does God honor? These are all important questions. What do you think? But more importantly, what does God think? 
What does God think? What process does God use to bring about healing? The answers are found uh, at least in part in the book of James. I believe that there is a dispensational approach as well, but for me I find some very clear answers to this type of thing in the simple practical book of James. Now before we turn to James, uh, however, let's take a brief look at five foundational truths undergirding our time in the passage of Scripture today. First of all, let me say to you that there are two classifications of sin. Original and personal. Original sin refers to the sin nature that we, as, that we as human beings have inherited from Adam. Personal sin is the daily disobedience that is spawned as an outflow of our Adamic nature. Original sin is the root. Personal sin is the fruit. Secondly, original sin introduced sickness and death to the human race. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 says this, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, that would be Adam. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all men have sinned. You see, had Adam and Eve never sinned in the Garden of Eden, they would have never died. They would have lived eternally. But because they disobeyed God, sickness and death spread to every living thing. The ultimate statistic is one on one. People are born, they live, they die. So in the broadest sense, all sickness and death are a result, they have, it, have their roots in original sin. Thirdly, sometimes you need to understand that there is a direct relationship between personal sin and sickness. Remember the story of David and Bathsheba in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12? I think you remember the story well. David committed uh, adultery with Bathsheba, arranged for her husband to be killed, and then refused to acknowledge his sin for some time. And finally, after a rebuke from the prophet uh, Nathan, where he put his long bony finger into the chest of David, uh, finally David confessed and repented. Psalm 32 is uh, David's journal of this period in his life. And it reveals uh, the physical sufferings that he experienced while refusing to acknowledge his sin. I just want you to listen to verses 3 and 4 or 3 and 4 of Psalm 32. Just listen as I as I quote them for you. He said, "When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. So he's talking about physical sickness and weakness. Fourthly, sometimes there is no relationship between personal sin and sickness. Uh, once when the disciples... Uh, and Jesus passed by a blind man, they asked the question, and it's found in John chapter 9, uh, they said, Rabbi, referring to Jesus, who sinned? This man or his parents, who sinned because he was born blind? And Jesus replied, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the work of God may, might be displayed in his life. Fifthly, listen carefully. It is not God's will that everyone be healed. There is no doubt from Scripture that the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle of Grace, had the gift of healing. 
If you study his ministry, you'll find that he was able to heal people. He was even able to give handkerchiefs to people, and people uh, got healed. But uh, yet he left uh, Trophimus, his friend, sick in Miletus. Epaphroditus almost died while ministering to Paul, yet Paul had the gift of healing. Why didn't he get healed? Timothy, Paul's spiritual son, had a stomach problem and frequent ailments, according to 1 Timothy 5.23. And Paul, the great apostle himself, asked God three times to remove his thorn in the flesh. But God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. In other words, Paul, no, no, no. Now, typically those who claim that it is God's will for everyone to be healed base their belief upon the last phrase of an Old Testament book, Isaiah, the 53rd chapter and the 5th verse, and they base their, their uh, belief upon these words, and by his wounds we are healed. However, the context of this verse refers to spiritual illness and healing, not physical. And I say that because Isaiah 50, 53, 5 is filled, listen to me carefully, with the language of substitution. The servant suffered, not for his own sins, since he was sinless, but it was a substitute for sinners. And because he took our place uh, on the cross, we know, we, we know that we now have peace with God and cannot be condemned by God's law. Listen to me. We are set free. If you are in Christ here tonight, the scripture says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You will never be condemned by the law of God because Jesus was condemned in your place. The healing in Isaiah 53, 5, refers to the forgiveness of sins, not the healing of the body. Let me tell you something, there is no physical healing in the atonement. That's why we have a lot of word of faith people claiming that they can heal people all over the place. And the Apostle Peter, that old fisherman apostle, he underscored uh, this particular truth when he wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, when he wrote these words, he said, he himself, referring to Jesus, he said, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. It's in a spiritual context. So, with these five facts to build on, let's listen now to James's prescription for those who are suffering, those who are troubled, those who are unhappy, and those who are sick. Verse 13. Here the scripture says in verse 13, right at the first part of the verse, is any one of you in trouble? Or is any one of you suffering? depending on the translation that you have. <clears throat> now let me just say this to you, that the Greek word for trouble and suffering here is literally in distress. It's a broad term that can mean mental illness. It's a term that can mean anxiety or some affliction from which there is no immediate relief. And the Apostle James uh, tells this person in that verse, is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. He doesn't promise that if we pray, we will be healed. Rather, he says, it is, it, it really, it's, it's as if James is exhorting us to pray for endurance, like Jesus' uh, uh, Jesus' prayer in John 17, 15. You know, Jesus prayed that great high priestly prayer in the 17th chapter of John. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Endurance. 
And as we learn from the lives of Paul and Trophimus and Epaphroditus and Timothy, listen to me carefully, God sometimes chooses not to remove certain afflictions. Instead, he uses them as tools. He uses them as tools to strengthen and build us up according to his will. Next, James jumps to the opposite extreme. From those who are troubled to those who are happy. He says in the 13th verse, the latter part of that, he asks the question, is any, anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Uh, listen, don't feel guilty because you're not experiencing the hardships of others. As Solomon wrote, and we quoted it at the funeral on uh, Friday, there is a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. So if you are joyful, James says, let it out. Sing. Sing praises and thank God for the blessings he has given you. Get involved with lifting your heart in prayer and praise to God. Sing. Beginning in verse 14, James uh, introduces the problem of physical illness. You see that in the 14th verse. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, you need to understand that the Greek term for sick used here in the text means without strength. It carries with it the idea of being totally incapacitated. And we really need to ask ourselves the question, what does James recommend in this situation? Well, first of all, the one who is sick should take the initiative and summon the elders of the church. And I say that simply because there's no way anyone can know you're sick unless you tell them. And yet many expect everyone in the church to somehow know and then they complain when nobody comes to help. You know, there are people who actually believe that pastors have great big huge crystal balls on their, on their desk and they know everything that's happening in the church. There's a good Greek word for that. Let me tell you what it is. You know what I'm going to say. It's hogwash. If you don't tell me you're sick, I'm not going to pray. And when we become seriously ill, our first step is to make others aware of our needs. Second, the elders are to carry out two functions. Now, I believe we've progressed from this time uh, uh, in the age of grace, but uh, let me just, we'll point this out to you, but they are, in terms of this particular passage of Scripture, they are to carry out two functions, and those two functions are to anoint and pray. See that at verse 14. But according to the Greek construction of the sentence, the verse actually reads and states, let them pray over him having anointed him with oil in the name of the Lord. You see, the anointing should precede the praying. And typically the word anoint is associated with a religious ceremony. You see it take place in Catholic churches all over the place, don't you? They anoint people with oil. where our oil is applied to the head. But as J. Adams points out in his book, wonderful little book, Christian Man, uh, in his little book, Competent to Counsel, and I quote, he says this, James did not write about ceremonial anointing at all. The ordinary word for a ceremonial anointing was, was uh, uh, kiro, a cognate of Christos or Christ, the anointed one. The word James used, Alfio, 
In contrast to the word creo, to anoint usually means to rub or simply apply. The word alfeo was used to describe the personal application of salves, lotions and perfumes which usually had an oil base. It was even used to speak of plastering walls. An alfetus was a trainer who rubbed down athletes in a, gymnasium, a gymnastic school. But the word alfeo used here in the text was used frequently in medical treatises. And so it turns out that what James required by the use of oil was the use of the best medical means of the day. James simply said to rub oil on the body and pray. In this passage he urged the treating of sickness by medical means accompanied by prayer. And the two are to be used together, neither to the exclusion of the other. So instead of teaching faith healing, Apart from the use of medicine, this passage teaches just the opposite. Fortunately, our medical expertise has advanced and improved from oil to antibiotics, x-rays and laser surgery. And just as elders in James' day were to see that proper medical treatment was applied, listen to me carefully, the same is true of elders today. You will never hear this preacher tell people, as many people, as many preachers do, to refrain from taking your medication. That leads people to despair. Third, James recommends that the sick leave the results in God's hands. You see, the elders were to anoint uh, and pray over the sick in the name of the Lord, invoking God's will for the situation. And that prayer of faith leads to three specific results found in the 15th verse. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, the Lord will raise him up, and if he has sinned, he will be forgiven. The three specific uh, results that James mentions are restoration, raising up, and forgiveness. Yes, he addresses the sins of the sick person too. And the context of the verse clearly indicates that this is a, a person who is suffering physically as a re direct result of personal sin. And evidence for this is found in the Greek word used for the phrase, will make the sick person well. The idea is restoration. And the little word uh, in the Greek text is uh, a sozo meaning saved. It's the same word that James used in the 20th verse of chapter 5. Look what it says there in the 20th verse. Remember this, whoever turns a sinner away from his error will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. You see, saving his soul from death is a reference to restoring that individual's spiritual life. The next result is that the Lord will raise this individual up, which does refer to physical healing. And if a person is physically ill due to unconfessed sin, then by confessing that sin, he or she can and may be healed physically. Notice I said may and can be and or may. Now I want you to note something. I want you to note that God does promise to raise up the individual. But he doesn't commit himself to a specific time. The healing may be instantaneous or it may be take a period of weeks or months or years or it may not take place until we begin to live in eternity with him. And in that case we'll have perfect healing. 
The final result of confessing is God's gracious forgiveness. So, in summary, let's glean uh, four practical measures to follow. Two from verse 16 and two from our passage as a whole. In verse 16 it says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. First, here it is, here's the first point, confession of sin is healthy. You know, if you confess your sin to the Lord or you confess your sin to a brother, it, it, it flushes out, it's therapeutic, isn't it? So confession of sin is healthy, employ it. Don't let sins build up in your life to the point that they make you physically ill. One well-known biblical scholar writes, and I quote, he says, in a very real sense, it is easier to confess sins to God than it is to confess them to men. And yet in sin, there are two barriers to be removed. The barrier it sets up between us and God and the barrier it sets up between us and our fellow men. If both these barriers are to be removed, then both kinds of confession must be made. Second, praying for one another is essential. Practice it. Praying for one another is essential. Practice it. An appropriate response to your friend's confessions would be to lift them up to the Lord in prayer. Let these uh, companions know that uh, you are willing to enter into their struggles in life. Let them hear your love and support being poured out on their behalf before the throne of grace. Thirdly, use of medical assistance is imperative. Obey it. Use of medical assistance is imperative, obey it. Asking others to pray for physical healing while ignoring proper medical treatment is not spiritual at all. Let me tell you what it is, it's foolish. Someone might rightly ask, why should I pray for your healing if you're not willing to do all that God commands like seeking medical assistance? Fourth. When healing comes from God, claim it. When healing comes from God, claim it. You see, whether or not an illness is the result of personal sin or not, uh, when God heals, listen, remember to thank Him and give Him the glory. Let me give you a final word. And for those of you who may be listening outside of the bounds of this church tonight who are tuning in perhaps to the message on the internet. As we've studied this passage, did you notice that James never once mentioned in the passage faith healers? Did you notice that? Not once. When we're sick in this particular passage, we are commanded to call for the leaders of the local assembly. And it makes no difference what their spiritual gifts are. They can be a, they can be a laborer who has a, a spiritual gift. They can be a pastor who has a, a spiritual gift. But you don't have to consult some spiritual guru who claims to have healing powers. Healing powers by the touch of his hand, usually with the request of money. So in conclusion, let me summarize my own personal convictions on this important topic. 
It's a view held by other men of God, such as John MacArthur, Charles Stanley, Charles R. Swindoll, H. A. Ironside, Donald Gray Barnhouse, A. W. Tozer, so I'm in good company. Here's my statement. I believe in divine healing. I do not believe in divine healers. I believe in faith healing. I do not believe in faith healers. There's a great difference. I believe that God in his sovereign grace and power will in fact reach down in some cases and change a condition and I am of the conviction that God does that apart from any individual who claims to have certain mystical healing powers. And all the people said, Amen. Thank you for tuning in with Pastor Ross Graham. And for more information about his ministry, visit www.gracebiblechurchkingswood.org. Until next time, God bless.